everyone and welcome to another She Clicks webinar. Today I'm delighted that this webinar is being sponsored by Fujifilm and they have sent a word from the sponsor. Fujifilm is one of the most well-known photography brands in the world. We pride ourselves in listening to the people who use our equipment and have created a range of award-winning cameras and lenses based on that feedback. There is something for all types of photographer and videographer in the X-Series and GFX system. So thank you to Fujifilm, it's very helpful of them to sponsor this uh, webinar. Tonight we're hearing from Glenis Garnett and she's going to be talking about developing a creative approach. So hi Glenis, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, how are you? Yeah, very Hello, good. Everybody. Thank you. <laughs> it's lovely to see you and thank you very much for agreeing to uh, do another webinar because this is your second one that you've done for it She is. Clicks. It is, yes, yeah, I'm pleased to be here and hope I can give you something to think about tonight really. I'm sure you will. Okay, well, over to you if you want to uh, start cracking on. So I'm going to get stuck uh, straight in, and I want to talk to you now, tonight about developing a creative approach. And um, this is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the barriers to creativity, what it is that stops you being creative. It's not about the, so much the technical stuff tonight. It's going to be about what stops you being creative. And then we'll look at how you can develop creativity through projects and, and I'll give you some suggestions for the type of projects you could probably do and I'll show you some examples of my work so that you can see the sort of projects I work on um, and I think before we, 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 we get into that I think it's worth looking at what, what, we, what creativity is, what it is, how do we define it and uh, I see creativity as a mindset. That's what it is. It's about looking differently at your subject matter, using your imagination and ideas to create something, to create something real. And you can have a lot of ideas and imagination, but that if you don't actually create something from it, then you're not being creative. And I think it's important to think about it in that way. But what does it mean to us as photographers? It means that we've got to spend time learning to see and observe. We've got to spend time on that. And you've got to learn to ignore the rules. I know people talk to you about rules in photography. And I'm a big, um, I'm a big fan of, of ignoring the rules as much as possible. And I think when you're trying to be creative, you've got to think about it in that way. And you've got to get rid of some preconceived ideas. You know, people will tell you things like, oh, you should do landscapes this way, or you should do portraiture that way. And I think it's important to get rid of those preconceived ideas if you want to start being creative. And there's a book that I've read called The Creative Habit, and it's by a lady called Twyla Tharp. Strange name, I know. But uh, Twyla Tharp's an American choreographer, and she wrote this book, and in it, one of the statements that stands out for me in that book is that creativity is an act of defiance. And, uh, and I think that works as a photographer for me. And, and I think you have to ask yourself these questions. Why do I have to do it this way? Why can't I be different? Why can't I do it my way? And I, and I think as a, as a, a creative, that's, that's the way you've got to approach your photography. And, and I want to just say a little bit about Kit. Um, I think photography, as a, the, to me, photography is two things. It's a craft that we've got to learn. And it's an art. And we use, when we, when we develop the skills of the craft, we can then start talking about the art of photography. But I think what you've got to think about with your kit is, you know, you don't have to, you don't, you shouldn't use the excuse that I haven't got in the right kit in order to be creative. You can be creative with any, any, any sort of kit you want. So I don't think, I think you have to be careful that you don't found that, fall down that little rabbit hole of thinking, um, oh, I must get the next best bit of equipment. Um, I must have this lens in order to be creative and I can't do any, uh, 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 and if I don't have that lens, I'm not going to be creative. You've got to work with what you've got because if, if creativity is a, uh, is a state of mind, then, then you should be able to be creative with whatever tool you've got, whether you've got a mobile phone or whether you've got um, a, a top of the range SLR or, or mirrorless camera. And, and I think it's important to remember that, that we, we do have to consider that a lot of us might only have, say, one camera and one lens. And uh, you, you're not, you know, I don't want you to think that you've got to go out and buy lots of specialist equipment in order to be creative. And I think the first piece of advice I would give you is to make your photography as personal as you possibly can. 
make it about you and how you see the world. And I have a little mantra that goes in my mind when I go out and do for my photographs. Um, I have this little mantra and it's make images about how you feel, not what something looks like. And you might think, well, what, what do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. This is an image and I've called it Afternoons in a Summer Woodland. And this is the image. It isn't all the separate images. This is the image. And at the end of May, we had some really, really nice weather. And I decided to go into the woods in the afternoon. I've got a little wood at the back of me. We were in sort of semi lockdown, I suppose. And, and I wander into the little woodland at the back of my house. And I got this feeling of being in this lovely um, dappled woodland with the light coming down. And you could just hear the birds singing and there's all the lovely colors, the greens, the yellows, the whites. And I wanted to try and encapsulate that in some images. And so I made a choice about the lens I was going to use. So I took a vintage lens, which is called an auto reflector. It's a 55 millimeter f1.7 lens. And I went into this patch of woodland for about, I think I took these over a course of two or three days. And I made some choices about what, what the reason I like this lens is because it's got a character about it that when you defocus it, when you, when you knock it out of focus and you point it towards light, uh, you get these lovely round bokeh balls. You get some lovely bokeh with this lens. And I decided to take a series of images, uh, multiple exposure images that would I defocus on, on the first image and then overlay with uh, in focus images and build up the image that way. And the, the difficulty with woodland often is that it's very busy. So it was an ideal way really for me to get rid of some of that busyness, but give that impression of what it's like in this, this summer woodland. And so I decided to bring these images together. And like I said at first, these, this is the image now. It isn't all the separate images. It's the way these images fit together. And that is the one image. That's how I would print that image as a single image. And that's what I mean about making images about how you feel and not what something looks like. I don't want to go into a woodland and just take images of the wood. Um, so that, that's, that's what I mean by that statement. And I think it's important to have some sort of statement for yourself, something that, you, that, that will remind you of why you're doing your photography and, and what you want to get from it. And when we come to talking about barriers, you look at this list and you think, hmm, what does she mean by this? The camera, letting yourself go, the massive stimuli, familiarity. These are all things that will get in the way of you doing, of you being creative, if you like, with your photography. And we're going to talk first about the camera because I know that's probably the most important thing for a lot of people. And what I would say is one of the main obstacles for being creative is is that you've got to learn the craft. You've got to learn the craft of photography. You've got to learn how the kit works. And it's, it can be hard, it can take a while. Some people can learn it in a, a month or a week. Some people can, it takes them years to, to, to learn it. But this is what you've got to start off with. You've got to learn the craft. You've got to take control of your camera. And the most important thing to me in your photography is exposure. You've got to learn that exposure triangle. You've got to understand how it works. It isn't that difficult. Um, if you go away from here tonight and say, right, I'm going to put it on manual. I'm going to come off auto completely. I'm going to go on manual. I'm just going to learn it. And it might take you, a, it might take you an hour, a day. It might take you a week. It might take you a few weeks, but take the time and the effort to do it because You'll, fall, you'll keep falling back into your comfort zone of leaving that camera on auto and you're not really taking control of that exposure. And it's really important to do that because you need to make choices, not let the camera take choices for you. And learn as many techniques as you can. And, and I always stress to people when I'm talking about, the, when I do a, a session on techniques, on, on, on the sort of techniques you can use with your camera, I always say, you know, the techniques aren't, not, aren't what make you creative. It's the way you use them and it's the intent. And, and if you've got all these little techniques available to you, your little camera toolbox, as it were, um, you can take them out whenever you want. So if you're doing, it doesn't matter whether you're doing uh, landscape photography, portrait photography. If you've got the option of using some of these techniques like ICM or you might want to choose do out of focus images and things like that 
then you've got them all there. So learn as many of these techniques as you possibly can. And I always say to people, shoot in RAW plus JPEG. Now, I don't know... I don't know the stand of all of you out there. You'll all be at different stages in your, in your photography journey. But what I would say is that you can't get away from the fact that we have to process. It's part of, it's part of photography. We have to process. Whether you're doing digital images or you're doing film, it, it, you, there is still a process to go through. And, you know, you've bought a camera. You may have spent up, upwards of £1,000 for a camera. And if you're shooting in JPEG, then you, you're not utilizing the full facilities of the camera you know you must shoot in raw and even if you're not processing even if you haven't reached that point where you're doing much post post processing or you, you're not sure how to post process then even if you're only using jpegs make sure you store the raws because at some point when you've learned that that post process and you can go back and use those raws and find and and, and actually reproduce better images from them than the, the JPEG. You know, the camera manufacturer makes the choices about the sort of JPEG. So, um, so you must shoot in RAW. And there's, there's other reasons as well when we get further into this about why you should shoot RAW. And you have to learn how the camera sees. We see things completely different. A, a human beings see things completely differently to the way the camera sees. Let me give you an example. Um, some of you might have done this. Um, you go out, you see a, you go out and you maybe shoot, go, in, go out, you see this lovely landscape view and you see a, a dominant feature in the landscape and you think, I want to take a photograph of that. So you get out your camera and somebody said to you, well, if you're gonna do landscapes, you've got to have a wide lens, you've got to have a wide angle. It's got to have really good depth of field. So you pop your camera into, onto F11 or F13 and you, uh, you get, you know, open the lens out as much as you can. And then you get it home and you look at it and you think, well, that's not how I saw it. I didn't, I didn't see that, I saw something different. And there, often the reason is, is because we see things differently. You know, our field of vision is about 50 millimeters. That's how we see things. So when you go out into the landscape or wherever you go, you will see something on, a, on the range of a 50 millimeter lens-ish. That's why 50 millimeter lenses were often put on uh, early fil on film cameras because it was sort of seen as the, the way that the, the, hum the, the human eye sees. So we don't see in the same way. So when, the, when you put that camera in front of a view, it's gonna record absolutely everything. So we learn to abstract, we learn to get rid of all the peripheral information and we just see that dominant uh, feature in the landscape. Uh, but the camera sees everything. So you've got, to, you've got to sort of understand the way that the camera is seeing if you want to reproduce something that you've seen in your mind's eye. And you've got to work on that. So, so what happens is we don't see all those peripheral bits that are happening around that, that dominant view. The camera does. So when you get that image back, it's got all those things in that, in that picture that are going to just distract from that particular view, uh, from that particular uh, feature or that subject matter. So you've got to think about the way that the camera views things. And uh, when we talk about composition, what I, what I like, I, th I think this is probably the best, best definition I've heard about composition is it's the strongest way of seeing. It's, it's, it's seeing the subject in the strongest way so that the next person that looks at that image is going to see the subject in the same way that you saw the subject or that focal point, if you like. So it's the strongest way of seeing is, is the way I can describe composition. And if you're struggling with composition, um, just go out and practice, just go out and practice different ways of, of composing images and see what, see, see how you can uh, uh, make something from, uh, you know, when you go out. And, uh, Post, from a post-processing point of view, um, you will have to you will have to do this at some point. You know, you, you can't avoid it really. As a photographer, you have to post-process, and and it, and I'm not talking about you know post-processing something uh, within an inch of its life. I mean, I I try to do as much as possible in camera so that I don't do have to do a lot of post-processing. That's the whole point of trying to get an image right in camera, not because there's some inherent special thing about doing it right in camera it's so that I don't have to spend a lot of time on the computer but one thing I will say one caveat to that is that you cannot fix or improve on the computer what you've failed to see and record you've got to see the thing that you, you, you you've got to see the subject matter and if you've made a poor image if you create a poor image it's badly composed you're not going to rescue it by post-processing so just bear that in mind and 
the one thing that people talk about when you, you know, when you learn the craft and you've learned how the camera works, it becomes almost intuitive when you go out. You don't actually think that much about all of the settings. You've got to get to that point where you're not thinking about how the camera works. And, and you know, you don't want to be in a situation where I've got, oh, where's the aperture? Where's this? You've got to have all that at hand. And you have to get into a point where I say, you know, you hear people say, oh, I got into the zone, oh, I get into the zone. And that's what this letting yourself go is. It's about getting out there, understanding the craft and learning the craft of photography, and then getting into the experience of going out and taking photographs and not having to think about all the technical bit that, 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 that's going on, if you like. You've got to try and separate that out. And that's when you start, um, that's when you start to, to really sort of, if you like, work, work the environment and work the subject. And um, you've got to abandon preconceptions about subject matter, you know, that you, you don't have to treat subject matter the way that other people tell you to treat it. So you don't have to have everything in focus. You don't have to do landscapes using a, 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 long, a large depth of field. You can do shallow depth of field landscapes and things like that. You can cut the top of people's heads off if you're doing portraits. You know, there's lots of different things you can do. You don't have to have, have these preconceptions. And don't, when you're first starting out to try be, being creative, don't be concerned about making good pictures. It doesn't matter. It's about being in the experience and getting out there and enjoying the world that you're in. You, I think photographers are often quite, you cut yourself off a little bit. You know, I do. I know I cut myself off. I go out and I'll take photographs and I can't work with other people around me. I just can't. I find them too distracting and I want to talk and things like that. And I, I can't do that when I'm doing photography. I have to cut myself off. And you've got to almost enjoy the world that you're in. You've got to enjoy being in that moment and enjoying taking the photographs. And, and if you're thinking about the technical stuff all the, all the time, you can't do that. You really have to sort of get, get your head around that, that part of it and relax and enjoy it for what it is. All the visual arts start with a blank page. We don't. As photographers, we've got this massive stimuli out there and, and we've got the whole world as our subject. So we have to learn to cut out an awful lot. And we have all this visual stimuli going on. And what happens, I mentioned earlier about human beings, is what we do is we cut, we cut things out. We get tunnel vision. And we learn not to see because we, we don't need all that visual stimuli. It, it's too much. And what you've got to do as a photographer, you've got to unlearn all that because you've got to start seeing and you've got to start seeing detail and you've got to seeing all these things. And when you do start doing that when you start seeing that it it can become quite um it can become quite overwhelming sometimes because you see things you see a subject in everything you see everything around you and so we've got to unlearn that that tunnel vision and we've got to start seeing what i call seeing the unseen and um you know there's a familiarity about everything and we tend to label things uh, we'll say things like, oh, there's a cup or there's a, a flower or there's a fern and let's go and photograph it. But what you've got to do is look at an object rather than seeing, you, you haven't to just look at an object, sorry. You've got, to, you've got to see it in all its facets. So when you see something like a cup, you know, you should be examining how does the light, how does the light touch the rim or how does the, how does the curve of the, um, uh, the, the the handle uh, work and how does the fern what does the fern look like if you get close up to it how do all those fronds work and how how much structure is there in that so you've got to start looking at things in that way in order to find things to photograph and what I would say I'd call that visual exploration and I think as a photographer that's what we do we've got to visually explore the world around us and it can become quite overwhelming but um, let me give you an example uh, with these images. This is a series of, Im of images I took. And um, this is, I think, this is broom grass, which is quite common grass. I think it looks like um, a little bit like barley, a little bit cross between barley and wheat. And you'll see it growing everywhere. And I just pulled up a clump of this broom grass. And I, I love the shape and the, the structure of it. So I popped it in a a jam jar on my patio table one, one after it was one I think it was last year this the I, I took these and 
I decided to sit and watch this broom grass and watch how it worked, how it worked in the light and how it worked in the, in the breeze before I started taking photographs. And I always say to people, don't be in a rush to get out the camera just to start taking uh, photographs. We'll watch something and observe it. And um, in this instance, I started squirting some water on as well and things like that and started taking photographs. And this is a study of just looking at this broom grass. I think I've probably about an hour's worth of photographs here, just taking images. And I'll move the subject around so that none of this, all of this is not been added you know it's not something I've not edited all the color in is this is I've just moved this so I've got a different color in the background and the background here you'll see is probably from some dandelions I think that I've got um, uh, in, uh, at the back and it, it's all about really about just visually exploring the subject and trying to get as much out of it as possible and, and, and almost tell a story about it and I did the same with these I think it's probably on the same day I did the same with these dandelion clocks and and I wanted to just get a feel for what they were like. And because they were, uh, you know, they, they come obviously from yellow dandelions. So the background is the out of focus areas of the, of, the, of the dandelion flowers. So, you know, that's what I mean by visual, visually exploring your subject. And you can do that with any subject. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be flower or landscape photography. It can be any sort of photography, any sort of photography, really. You should be thinking about visually exploring um, um, especially even, even with um, uh, portrait photography or architectural photography, I think it's important to spend time just, um, you know, sort of uh, getting that uh, uh, visual exploration uh, about it. And uh, the ability to see is not increased by distance. And what I mean by that is if you are going to spend some time, if you don't visually explore your own environment, you know, everything that's going on around you, whether that's just a simple cup or whether it's a, uh, uh, the back of your garden or it's, it's a, a local park, if you, if you don't learn how to visually explore, then you have to ask yourself is, if you can't do it now, how are you going to do it if you go to Venice or if you go to America or if you go to uh, the, the coast or the, or, or the uh, you know or, or, the, or the town down the road you've got to have you've got to you've got to develop that seeing in order to 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 um uh, to see, you've got to develop that seeing and distance is not going to make it is not going to make any difference so it, you know it's not you're not going to get any better photographs by going to necessarily to exotic places so th that's the point I'm trying to make with that, really. And good photographic expression is impossible without good seeing. So seeing is a really important, seeing and observation is a really important part of, of being creative and, 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 and with your photography. And um, that brings me to getting out of your comfort zone. Um, and I think that's what you have to work on. Um, you will fall into a comfort zone every time you go out. Obviously. You might go out with the same lens and pop the same. You'll have a favourite lens, probably. Uh, and you'll go out probably with the same lens on and, 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 and end up shooting the same things and then probably come back and be a little bit dissatisfied with it. And so what I would say, I talked earlier about, you know, learn as many techniques as you can. You learn, learn how to do things like shoot through. So if you don't know what that is, I'll explain it in a, in a picture further on. I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by shoot through. You know, use soft focus. Soft focus is a really, really useful, it's a really, really lovely creative tool. And especially with um, uh, portrait photography, you know, knocking the focus back a little bit can just give you that lovely ethereal feel that you might, um, uh, that you can get. And, and knocking things out of focus uh, can be a, a really good creative uh, 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 tool and have a go at intense in, intentional camera movement have a go at ICM have a go at multiple exposure if you don't have it on your camera obviously you can't do it but if you have got it on your camera have a little play with multiple exposure and go out and shoot your landscapes wide open don't go shooting your landscape you don't have to shoot every landscape at f13 you can do it however you like and you know try shooting in black and white and and I say now shooting in black and white. I don't mean converting to black and white. Um, and the reason I say shoot in black and white is because, you know, we go out and we take images and then we, we all do this. I've done it. And we go out, we'll take images. And then you come back and you think, oh, I wonder what that looks like in black and white. 
and you have a look and you convert it and you think, well, it's all right. But your, your hit rate's going to be lower because your criteria for taking that image has been, you've been looking at it in colour. And so with the absence of colour, you've only got shape and line and texture and contrasts around the, you know, the lighting. So, you know, the images are going to be different if you shoot in black and white. And this is another reason why I say to shoot raw, because if you, if you put your camera into black and white, the image you produce as a JPEG will be a black and white image, but your raw image will still be in colour because it'll store the raw image as a colour image. So you're not going to, you, you gain by doing that. So if you find that the black and white image hasn't, you know, isn't quite right, you can go at it again and you can, you can convert it in from the raw in, uh, in, in, in Lightroom or Photoshop. And I think it's important as a, as a compositional tool, uh, shooting in black and white is a really good way sometimes of learning composition because you're no longer relying on colour for the emphasis for the subject so you've really got to work harder to find a subject when you're shooting in black and white because you're only you, you, you know the end the colour's not there and uh, whereas you might use a colour say red and the people if you see red in an image your eye will always be drawn to it because it's a very dominant colour but if you haven't got that red in a black and white image then you've got to work harder at getting an appropriate uh, subject or a focal point and Restrict yourself. Now, I know many of you out there might not have more than one lens. That's fine, you know. But what I would say is, if, if and I think majority probably, if you've got a, a zoom lens, you probably have a zoom lens, even if you've got, not got more than one lens. And what I would say is just go out and shoot at one focal lens. So if you've got, say, an 18 to 55 or an 18 to 24 zoom lens, just shoot at one focal lens. Just leave it at 35 millimeters, 24 millimeters. Just leave it at one focal length. And instead of zooming, because remember, when you zoom, you're compressing an image. So the image will look different by zooming in than it will if you walk. So use your legs and walk forwards or walk backwards, but just use one focal length. And that will give a completely different view to if, you, if you're zooming in and out all the time. You know, people I think are too ready to use the zoom without, without thinking about um, how that's gonna affect the overall image. And, and the same with the f-stop, you know, all of these images here, we're all taken with that auto reflector I mentioned earlier, that vintage lens. And these are all taken at one f-stop, f1.7. And they're all, they're just, they're just, that's what I made a choice of going. I want to go out and shoot at that f-stop. I use f, I use wide open f-stops a lot for, for shooting uh, landscapes and uh, flowers, of, of course, and things like that. And and I'm, I mentioned earlier about not, you're not necessarily going out and buying lots of kit, but you, you know, you can do vintage, if you've got a mirrorless, if, you, if, you've, if you've bought into the mirrorless system, the mirrorless is great for using uh, vintage lenses because having a, first of all, having an EVF, uh, an electronic viewfinder, you've got this, what you see is what you get. So it's really easy to work out what your exposure is going to be because you can see how the exposure is working through the, uh, the electronic viewfinder. But the vintage lenses, um, you know, you can pick up vintage lenses for 20, 25 quid, 30 quid on, on eBay or, or wherever. And um, you can sort of build up a nice little um, uh, collection of vintage lenses. And what we often buy vintage lenses is for the characters. So we're often looking at things like bokeh and the way that they render bokeh and, and things like that. And, and often how they render softness because some, some of them are soft, not all of them are soft. But you, you just need a... A fil you just need a little um, adapter for your, you just need one of these little adapters for your, I'll show you that, it's an adapter, and that fits onto your particular lens, there you go, that's an adapter, that fits onto the Fuji, this just, ha this happens to have also a tilt effect, this has also got a tilt effect on this, so this actually tilts the lens as well, and that just screws onto whatever fitting you've got your lenses, so you've got your uh, your, your lens there and you see there it, you might not be able to see on here but it actually dips the lens backwards and forwards but you just get a standard one of, of these and um, you know you can you can look at buying lens the, a lens baby the lens baby range of lenses this is actually a, a sweet spot this is called what's called the composer and the composer lens allows you to change out the this element here so this is what's called the sweet spot this is called the Sweet 35. That's gonna, it's gonna be backwards way around, isn't it? Yeah, that's sweet 35. So it's a 35 millimeter lens with a sweet spot in the middle. 
and round the outside it's a little bit blurry and that goes up for that goes from f 2.5 up to f22 but you can also get a little lens baby trio and this trio lens has got three lenses in there and you twist them round and you've got three different lenses and that's quite interesting uh, to, to play about with. So there's all sorts of little things and gizmos you can get and if you're a little bit adventurous make get yourself a body cap a, a spare body cap off your camera and make a little pinhole lens and that's got that's actually got a piece of foil on there heavy duty foil and there's a little pinhole in there that's been you can't see it that 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 hole there is the wall that's drilled it's a bigger hole that's drilled but you create a smaller hole and you that's just got a, a uv filter on there to prep so, so that i don't get dust into the sensor uh, and just put that on the front of the lens whack the camera up to 1600 I, iso and go out and do some pinhole photography and you don't have an aperture you've just got one aperture you don't do anything you just go out and shoot and it's uh, it's fun um, you know, find an old UV filter and scratch it and pop that on the front and you'll get a nice soft edge. You know, we used to put Vaseline on uh, years ago before, um, before all the fancy stuff came out. And if you've got, if, you know, pick up an infrared filter and stick that on the front of your lens. That can be fun. Um, it, it's a bit of a, bit of a separate, it, it's a bit of an art in itself doing infrared photography. You can have your camera converted, but I'm just talking about putting a lens on a, a little um, filter on the front and I'll show you some photos with that. But one of the things you can do is one of the things I'd advise you to do is go out with someone else. I don't mean go out and do a workshop. I don't mean go out and let somebody tell you where to put your tripod or set the camera up. I mean, go out with somebody that shoots differently to you. So if you're somebody that shoots quite slowly and you're not, you know, you're a bit more mannered and you're a bit more thoughtful about it, go out with somebody that shoots by the hip who really goes out and fires away and see what they do, but don't just go out or, or the, and the opposite. You know, if you're, if you're the somebody that shoots by all the time, it click, click, click all the time, go out with somebody that's a little bit more slow and a bit more thoughtful about the photography and ask them not what settings they're using, just ask them what they're thinking. What are the thought process they're going through when they're actually taking those images and how are they taking those images? What are they trying to do and what they're trying to achieve? And you can get an awful lot, of, uh, of uh, out of going out with somebody like that. So if you've got somebody that, you know, hopefully somebody that's a little bit, maybe a little bit more advanced than you in terms of your photography, so that you can get some some um, some uh, uh, benefit of their experience. And um, I'm going to talk to you now about the rules. And I want to give you permission to break the rules. It's okay to break the rules in photography. You can do whatever you want with with your camera. And I'm going to. I think the acronym ROT is a really good acronym for rule of thirds. And, um, and I'm not saying it's bad to use the rule of thirds, but the problem is, is if you get stuck into using that all the time with your photography, it can make your images very static, very formulaic, and you can fall down that little hole of being um, uh, cliched. It can actually make your work look a little bit cliched. And there are alternatives and for those of you that use Lightroom, you know, you can use different layouts for your, for your composition. You don't have to use the rule of thirds. And for those of you that like, use Lightroom, um, if, you, if you crop an image, you've got a crop overlay, and I can guarantee you probably get it set as rule of thirds. So I'm gonna just pop into uh, Lightroom for you now. I've got, I'm in the crop tool at the moment, uh, the crop overlay tool in Lightroom. And, um, if you're in the crop overlay, overlay um, uh, tool, then if you press the O button, it will change the crop overlay for you. So you can see the different overlays. So if you like to crop all your images to four by five and things like that, it shows you where to, where to crop them. So you go through these crop overlays and sometimes it's worth, you know, this, this image in particular, doesn't work if we look at the rule of thirds this image doesn't work with the rule of thirds it, it, it just doesn't so but if we look at the sorry let's go into the uh, there we go that's it if you look at this format um, everything fits into these triangles and it balances out in the in the composition so it's worthwhile looking at some of your images and 
seeing whether you'd be better working with a different type of layout and a format. And you might actually find your compositions get better by looking at options uh, for, for different layouts. Some can be, get quite complicated, but certainly it's worth looking at that. And also consider different formats in terms of ratios. So I prefer the four by five and the square ratio for a lot of my images. And this is another reason why shooting raw is a good thing because if you change your ratio in the camera and you start shooting in square format, the camera will store the raw as the full size image in, uh, uh, in, in, as a raw file. So you're not losing anything. You're not actually losing those pixels. You're only losing pixels when you crop it in Lightroom or Photoshop. So, and, and I find sometimes using a square format can fit images uh, and, and work in terms of composition a lot better sometimes. So, so consider going out and using those sort of formats because you might find you work better, you can, com you can compose the image better. And what I find as well with, with, with a square format is you can use the corners more effectively. Whereas with a wider format, what sometimes happens is you can get a distracting element in, in the wider format. And what that does is it drags your eye away from the subject. Whereas in a square format, it's not as obvious and it can help you actually to maintain and keep, keep the, the, the eye on the subject. So consider those, those sort of uh, things when, you, when you're thinking of um, the sort of layouts and the ratios that you're using. And you can shoot wonky horizons. You can have a middle horizon. You can have no focal point. You can do all of these things. It doesn't matter. You can have a wonky horizon. You can have your horizon in the middle and your subject, you know, your line up, up the middle. You can have your subject out of focus. You can waggle your camera. You can wiggle it, do some wiggling with ICM. You don't have to have a focal point. You can have lens flare. You can underexpose images, you know, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about the histogram and exposure uh, in, a, in, in some of the other shots. And all of these shots are just out, are out of focus. Um, the top ones have been taken with the lens baby and they are just on the edge of softness. They're not quite in focus, but for me, that doesn't matter. I'm trying to create an impression of these poppies and a representation. I'm not trying to create a record of what they look like. I'm just trying to create an impression of them. And these bottom images here have been taken with um, a, a vintage Helios lens. And one of the things we do with the vintage Helios, if you get hold of one, a four, what's called a 44-2 generally, they have what's called this swirly bokeh. The bokeh is a little bit swirly in the background. And what we do is we take out the front element. What we mean by the front element is that, that element that sits in the front of the lens out. We take the retaining ring out and we flick the element round. And what that does is it actually creates a more accentuated um, uh, effect of the bokeh. It can look a little bit strange, a bit weird and wonderful and a bit marmite-ish. But um, these images at the bottom are taken with a, an extension tube on with, with one of these type of lenses with an extension tube. So I'm using it almost like a macro lens. And then it's so, it's so strange when you get in, when you get that, that with, the, with the reverse front element that you, it's so soft in the middle, you can't really focus. So you get this lovely soft rendering of the image. And, I think the hardest thing for a photographer to do is to let go of focus. It really is hard to not do think something in focus. It is hard. It's difficult. We all we all have to we all have to work on that. But you can get some very lovely painted effects. Imagine doing some of that with say a in a with a lovely uh, portrait or something like that. And oh, I wanted to say something about um, portraits. On that, get out of your comfort zone about soft focus. If you want to go and have a look at Julia Margaret Cameron. Google that, make a note of it, Julia Margaret Cameron. She was doing photography in the 1850s and she got her first lens bought by her children, I think, when she was about 50 years old. Um, and she started making photographs, first of all, of her children, her, her family. And she actually used, purposely used soft focus to create, to do portrait photography. And of course, all the photographers of the day poo-pooed the work that she did because she was a woman and they were all men. So, you know, you know, not as much changed, but um, she, um, she did a lot of soft focus um, portrait photography and she's worth a look, really go and have a look at the work. It's lovely, but it might not be to your taste. It's, it's up to you. It's quite, 
it's all black and white, obviously, uh, but have a look at the work. And I want to say something about white. White is a colour. And what this is, again, we're back with the rules. People will tell you that you shouldn't blow out your highlights. And blowing out your highlights is a creative tool. You know, having white in your image is, there's nothing wrong with having white in, in, in your image. It's a very, very good way of adding some really lovely contrast and light into an image. And people will say, don't, you know, stack all your pixels up towards this end of the histogram, but don't let them go, you know, don't overexpose whatever you do. Um, this is why taking control of your exposure is important because sometimes you want to get, you want to overexpose. Sometimes you have to overexpose because what the camera will do is it will try, it will always try to expose. And this is what it will do when you're in, when you're in auto mode, it will always try to expose to a mid gray. So what will happen in, in all of these circumstances, if I'd have let the camera expose all of these shots, I'd have got very, very muddy images that have been very mid-grey muddy images. So I had to overexpose these by probably two, maybe three stops. This particular image down here was on a very, very sunny day on, on the beach at Crosby and the light was very bright. And so the images, if they were normal exposed, let the camera expose them, they're just mid mucky looking images really and the same applies in snow you know you'll have heard people say when you when you're in snow you've got to overexpose and so don't think of white I, I hate to see images where people have um pulled the highlights back and they pull them back too much so it makes it look unnatural you know we have white white is a color so consider using white as a as a creative tool and one of the things I think that you have to be careful of with your photography is the expectations of others. When you shoot to a brief, and commercial photographers work, often work to a brief and, and they'll work for a client, so they've got a limit to what they can do in terms of the creativity of the, of the subject. They've got to work towards that client brief. You don't have to, if you're not, if you're not a commercial photographer, you can, you can work however you want. But what you should avoid is trying to make images about what you, th what you think other people want to see. It, it's a thing I hear people pop up, oh, you know, uh, I, I, and, and I, please don't get me wrong, I don't want to say anything, I, I won't ever say anything bad about uh, camera clubs. Um, but I, I hear, often hear little, little things said like, oh, I, I better not do that because that particular judge won't like that. And that's, that's something that, you've got to come to terms with as a photographer, you know, you've got, you're restricting yourself in a way. So being creative, you've not got to be thinking about what other people want you to shoot. You've got to sort of try and go off on, on your own in a way. And that might not be popular. You know, you might want to show your images to friends and family and they'll say things like, well, oh, that's all right, is that, but um, I really like your other stuff. And so it can actually bring your, your confidence down a little bit because you want to try something different. But I think it's important to develop your own vision, to really think about what it is you want to say and how you want to say it. And coming back to that mantra about, you know, images that, that you, about how you feel rather than uh, what something looks like. If you want to go out and shoot photos of, some, what something looks like that's all right as well um and so it's poppy time so if you've got a poppy field nearby go out into the poppy field at different times of the day try lots of different ways of shooting try this shoot through i will show, tell you what shoot through is uh, try this shoot through method take some multiple exposures try some icm go at the golden hour lay down on the floor and point your camera up and catch a bit of flare and things like that. And just spend your time immersing yourself in the, in the subject. You know, that, that's what it's all about. Do a little montage, create some little montages and things like that. This is what I mean by shoot through. This has been taken with this lens baby. And I've taken it at F2.5. And what I mean by shoot through, and it's used by flower photographers a lot, you can do it in any sort of photography, you can do it with portraits, you can do it with any sort of photography really, uh, shoot through, is we, we bring the foliage, we bring foliage right up to the lens and then shoot, find a little gap and you shoot through that, that, that gap in the foliage. So you're looking to just focus on a gap in the foliage and that's got the effect of throwing all of the 
surrounding it's got the effect of throwing all this surrounding area out of focus and it's a common it's a common way of shooting um uh, you know do it with things like butterflies if in fact it's great with 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 wildlife because if uh, wildlife insects and things like that because if you don't want to disturb them and you're using a long lens it's a really good way is to shoot through because they, they, you know you won't disturb them as much but these are just on focus these on this edge and you can see here how all of the barley this is shot through barley and it's all gone out of focus around here and you could do this in Lightroom or in Photoshop, but it wouldn't have the same effect. It's not the same. And I did mention I want to get everything as right in camera. I don't want to spend time in, in Lightroom. Um, so what, and these sort of out of focus rendered parts here are, are the features of the lens. This is why I like shooting with these sort of lenses. It's similar to vintage lenses is that you're getting the, the rendering, if you like, of those out of focus uh, areas is different with certain lenses and you could probably simulate this in Lightroom but I, I'm not I'm not really interested in, in doing that and I just want to give you some suggestions of different ways of these are all obviously woodland it's one of my 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 sort of favorite subjects is woodland but this is an image shot it's a multiple exposure image it's uh, three or four images I think and all I've done with this is I've taken I've set up multiple exposure probably in average mode and I've just taken one image, moved slightly, taken another image, moved slightly again, taken another image, and you build the image up like that. So it gives it that painterly, impressionistic look. This image is in a woodland, and this is snow that's creating this painterly look on this. That's all it is. And it's snow taken. So I've, I've found an, a nice gray area in the woodland with a little bit of color. And then I've used the snow to create the painterly effect. So this is falling snow in front of the lens at about a 30th of a second. And if you use about under, say, under 60th of a second, you'll get a nice flowing effect of snow coming across a, a, a lens. Maybe not at this time of year, but I don't know. You may be somewhere where it's snow at the moment. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, and this is a, an example of a, a double exposure taken at a widish angle. And it's just a, a shot taken here and a shot taken there and overlaying a shot using probably an average mode. I think this is the Fuji X-T3 so, or the X-T2. So it will, and the Fuji before the X-T4 only had two, uh, you can only do two, uh, a double exposure. You couldn't do any more than that. So this one is taken with... Uh, and, and the way that it blends, it blends almost like a, the lighting mode in, in Photoshop. So it's sort of like an average mode in, in other cameras. And this one is taken in the same woodland, but this time I've shot it with a telephoto. And I mentioned earlier that the telephoto will compress the subject. It will compress all that subject. So by taking it with a telephoto, I think there was a taken about 200 millimeters. Um, it's got the effect of compressing the image. And so I've taken a double exposure with this and then um, and that the actual original image of this just looks like a bit gray. It's just like almost looks black and white. So what I've done with this is I've uh, I've applied a duo tone, uh, a split toning in Photoshop, in Lightroom, sorry, of cream and orange or dark orange and, or brown or something like that. And it, that's given me this effect. And that's got the effect of flattening it and making it look almost like a graphic illustration rather than a photograph. I mean, if you zoomed into this, you see it is a photograph, but it looks almost like a graphic illustration. So that's how the using the different focal lengths can have a, a difference uh, as, as well on, on the sort of images that you're creating. And these are images taken. This is an image taken with a, um, a, an infrared filter. And what I've done with this is I've used the Fuji. The Fuji comes with a, a number of different film simulations. So you've got things like Fuji Velvius, uh, you've got um, Eterna Bleach Bypass, you've got Acros Black and White, you've got Sepia. And what I'll sometimes do is experiment with multiple exposures by using the different film simulations to build up the image. This one is an, has also got an infrared filter on the front. So I've put the infrared filter on and I've done a double exposure image using two different film simulations. So it's had the effect of the color. Now, normally with, a, with an infrared uh, filter, you convert into black and white because you can't, you can't really take a color image with them. But because I've used different film simulations, it's given me a little bit of color. So it's a little bit of an, an interesting experiment that. And I am not ashamed to say I use my mobile phone for making a lot of ICMs. Um, 
I think I've got a little app on my phone called Silky Water. And if you have a Huawei phone, you probably have got it. And the thing I love about this little app is that you can actually see the image build up as you're moving the if you're moving the, the phone, you can see the image build up so you know when to stop, you know when to stop it. And, and this, is, this is when we used to go to cafes a long time ago. And um, this, is, um, this is taken in one of the cafes I used to frequent um, uh, uh, way back in the day. And, uh, and this is uh, the little pinno. This is a place up the road from me called Denbydale. And uh, this is a pinhole uh, image taken uh, of the viaduct. And all I've done is I've, I've increased the ISO up to about 1600. So, and, and the thing is with old photographs, they often look a bit grainy. And so it looks a bit grainy. And it's, um, it's the viaduct, the railway viaduct, uh, uh, going across the, the Dern Valley down towards, uh, so it's going down towards Barnsley is the, the viaduct. But, um, you know, using something like a pinhole camera and go out, and it's quite actually liberating, not having to worry about f-stops and things like that. Just go out, put it on and just go out and shoot. So the key to creativity is play and experimentation. And you've got to be prepared to fail. Um, artists are, are, are used to failing. We fail a lot. We always fail. Part of the failure is learning something along the way. And you've got to develop this curiosity. You know, what if I did this? What if I went with a silly idea? What if I tried this? Trust your instincts and try and break down some of those barriers that, that, that you may have. And these three images um, uh, are taken again with the Fuji X-T4. And these were taken again using the film simulations. And I've stood over... I've, I've stood over a, a little stream with water rushing under water rushing under a little footbridge. And um, these images have been taken. One, I think the bottom one was taken. The first one was a sepia. And then that's been overlaid with a, a black and white image. And then that's been overlaid with a colour image. So it's built up this image of the, the water moving about. So it's built up this lovely um, uh, abstract image. And... Uh, this is the same up here, but I think I've coloured this a little bit. I think I've pushed the colouring a little bit in Lightroom on this one. But you, you can, you've really got to sort of play and play with what you've got on your camera. You know, try all the different things out. Even try to some, some of the toy camera modes on your camera, things like that. Just little things that will, will help you. And before we just finish this little section, we'll say use your camera every day. If you can, use it every day. Tree is an observational tool. Use your phone as a sketchbook. So if you if you can't remember, you know, you'll go out sometimes, you think, oh, that'd make a good project, but you don't you forget about it, your days get busy, so you forget about it. So use your phone as a little sketchbook to remind you about things and remind you about maybe little projects that you can do, or keep a notebook, anything that, that, that will remind you about something. And use your tablet as an inspirations folder. What do I mean by that? Um, if you've got a tablet or an iPad or whatever. Just capture images of things that you really like. And what will happen over a period of time, you'll build, up a, you'll build up a lot of images. And this might sound silly to you, but you'll learn what it is that you'll really like. You'll see the sort of images that you really like because we are bombarded with all this imagery and all this, this you know, visual stimuli. So you might discover that you like muted images, that you like muted palettes. So. And you may be finding that your editing is not tying up with that. You might think, well, I'm doing all these nice images, but they're not quite right. And so your palette, it may be a case of, well, you might think, well, if I just soften the contrast a little bit and reduce the colour on that image, I might get nearer to what the sort of things I like. You might find you like really graphic images or, you know, really contrasty images. You might like long exposures. But you've got to sort of almost build up a profile of what you like. And then you can start, that's an indication of the sort of things you really should, should be shooting, really, uh, 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 and everything. And do a little bit of research, you know, think about uh, artists. And I'm a big, I, I get a lot of my inspiration from artists as well as photographers, but mostly from artists. And um, I spend a lot of time looking at, at, at art. And um, 
you know, learn about these different artists and these different photographers, and but study bodies of work. What I say is look at bodies of work. Don't just look at one set of shots. Look at the way that some of these artists or photographers have developed themselves over a period. And you really sort of pick up a flow of, of the way that they work and, and, and things like that. And, and it's useful to study periods or movements. So if you say, for instance, studied like something like the the Bauhaus movement, for instance, there's a really funny video actually with Vic Reeves. I don't know what it's called. I'll have to put it on. I'll have to point it to it on Sheeklet. It's by Vic Reeves, and, and he gets a group of students, and uh, they they work. They, they, he goes to visit a group of um, uh, art students, and they work in the Bauhaus fashion. It's quite a funny video actually. Uh, but the Bauhaus movement often used photography. And because we did, didn't have digital, they'd print the, the, the images and then they'd cut them up and they'd use them in montages. And so there's all sorts of things you can do like that. You know, have a little play, just be a little bit more adventurous. And, and look at films and TV. You know, films are a real good source of learning about things like um, lighting and the way that they use atmosphere. And uh, one of the best movies some of the best movies to watch for looking for really good stills of the coen brothers movies i think they're fantastic there's always a few shots in there where you think that's a still image and they're really good to watch and uh, they're really it's really useful to watch them and and I'd, I'd point you to a photographer who actually was a film director and his name is gregory crudson and you may have heard of him you may not it's gregory crudson go and have a look at his work because his works are set up like a film set he actually designs them like a film set and he takes images and you can sit and look at those images you know all night the beautiful images but they're very contemporary and they're very managed uh, but they almost look like a film set but i think that's coming from his film background so they're very filmic in nature so we finished that little section and we're going to go on to using projects but what i'd like to do is have a little natural break there so i'm going to just stop sharing the screen for a minute if that's all right yeah and if anybody wants to ask any questions or oh, you've got any questions for me yeah. Please fire away. yeah we've got a few questions already um i'll start with the ones in the q a box um so Alexandra has asked, do, do you see yourself primarily as an artist or a photographer? I see myself mostly as a photographer. Okay. Um, I don't like to label myself because um, I don't think, that, think that's important. And I don't think you should label yourself as a portrait photographer or a landscape photographer. I think there's a distinction between commercial photography and everything else. So if anything, I'd say... If I had to distinguish, to me, there's commercial photography and everybody else is a creative photographer. That's the way I would see it, you know, just as a point of distingu disting distinction, if you like. But. Okay, thank you. Um, Annette has asked, uh, would you shoot in manual instead of aperture priority? And if so, do you use a light meter? I don't use a light meter. Um, I use I use manual all the time. I don't go. I don't bother with with. Um, uh, there are there may be the odd occasion where I might use aperture priority, and that might be when I'm possibly shooting wildlife. So if I went to Bempton Cliffs, say, next week or whenever, and I started to shoot the gannets and things like that, then I might put it in aperture priority mm -hmm. because. I don't really want to be messing because when you're in manual, remember, you're going to have to change your shutter speed by manual and you change your aperture priorities. So I'd just have it open at a particular aperture for the for the birds and then uh, I'd let the camera do the shutter speed for me. But even then, even then, I might want to overexpose. So I, I, even then, I'd probably take over the uh, the shutter, I'd pop it, pop it into manual because, um, again, you're, you're often in situations where you don't want that muddy grey, you don't want that underexposure, and, and that, that's yeah. the problem. One thing I will say about using manual uh, for people that probably aren't aware of, of it, that as soon as you're in manual, you don't have to worry about spot metering, matrix metering, all those different metering types. You don't have to think about it because you're, you're in control of it. So what was the question again, Annette? Well, it's, it was, uh, would you use manual instead of aperture priority? And do yeah, I'll say it? all the time I use manual. Yeah. I, I can't imagine a time now when I, when I would use anything. But. I think maybe perhaps aided by the fact that you use a mirrorless camera because yeah. Yeah. you're always seeing 
you see what you see is what you, you will want. capture it so if you're wanting to overexpose you you can actually see, you see the effect it. you're getting yeah, you can yeah. see it that's the big advantage of shooting mirrorless and of course when you're shooting with manual lenses as well or you if you're shooting if you're shooting manually with your lens you know you're not on autofocus for instance yeah. or when certainly with vintage lenses and the lens baby you're on manual focus uh you you've got focus peaking and um that's one of the big advantages of mirrorless yeah, yeah. Focus peaking, for anyone who doesn't know, is basically a system which highlights the areas of highest contrast, which is usually the area that, that is sharpest, of sharpest focus, and you can make it show up as different colours. So it's quite funny the first time you use it, because you kind of see, as you adjust your lens, you'll see like a wave of red or green, whatever colour you're using, come towards you and move away. Yeah. Um, it can be very useful. Um, if you use an SLR, you can shoot in live view mode, and many have... Um, they have focus peaking and also you usually then can also see the impact of the camera settings so that might be another way of of doing it with an slr okay thank you for that uh francesca has asked a couple of questions what software do you use oh sorry what software did you use to create the picture of the 16 images i think she means the layout i'll just add that in an app i just did that in an app and um i could have done it in uh i did it originally in photoshop uh, so I just created a grid in Photoshop. It's it's right. it's fairly easy to do. But then I actually, um, but what I do with my images, I'll pop them into a collection in Lightroom. So then I'll I'll have in order to put that on social media, I will just I would just um, use an app on so uh, an app on my tablet, and I'll have reproduced it in the app as well. So that okay. I'm not, uh, you know, just I'll do it. So I might want to just move some of them around, a bit like that nice those squares things. You move them around. But I, I use both. I, I either use Photoshop or I'll use... You can remember you can use Lightroom as well. Yeah. Because you can use the print module, uh, yeah. place things in, in in a square and print module and then export it as a, a JPEG or a, a, a PDF, whichever way. There's a, a really useful app called um, Adobe Spark, which yes. is if anyone's got the, um, the pho photography uh, plan, is, is free or it, it's part of that plan. It normally, I think it costs something like 10 pounds, 10 pence individually f f for a month for Spark. But if it's 9.98 for the photography plan and Spark is part of it, yeah. and you can create really easy grids with that. It's really useful, you know, really nice collages. And what's great about that is you can quickly swap between, you know, you've got, if you make a nice layout that's square and then you think, oh, I want to make an Instagram story, you can click on, that and it just rejects it all it's very very clever i recommend yeah, that it is, yeah um francesca has asked again the dandelion image of nine images what lens did you use there i think i was using my fuji 80 millimeter uh i think i was using the 80 millimeter macro um okay. yeah yeah i was yeah i don't always know i don't always remember because i, no. I, I, I could tell you if i went into lightroom but i, I, I suspect it probably was the okay Micro. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sarah has asked, do you ever use any lights for any of the work that you do at home or in the field, or do you just use natural and ambient light? Occasionally use, uh, I've got a little um, uh, Manfrotto uh, light, you know, the little the LED little, yeah, yeah. And I, st yeah. I have that in the bag just in case I yeah. need it. If you're in the woodland and you need a little bit of a little bit of front light and you're out in the woodland yeah. doing mushrooms or or especially in um spring woodland where you're doing flowers and occasionally yeah. but i'm often looking for natural light at home that's different if i'm if i'm doing still life i'll tr i actually like to do mostly natural light if i can window light and i've got a really nice sort of window that, that gathers the light nicely but i do use lights I'll, I'll use lights for all sorts of things i've got a little bag of uh, all different continuous lights and flash and things like yeah. that um, okay. But if I can, I, can, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, understood. Uh, Trace, well, actually, we've got a series of questions now that relate to the, the adapter that you showed. I think it was um, a little, uh, an adapter for vintage lenses. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then there was um, a tilt adapter for vintage yeah. lenses. Yeah, you, you normally buy an adapter for your vintage lens. Uh, and what you do, you buy one for the camera, and it'll have the fitting on the front for the type of vintage lens you're buying so these are what what are called m42 so it's like this, the old screw fit that you used to get on the pentax lenses and these are the commonest of the m42 lenses you get Leica and all sorts of things this particular one which is for the fuji 
and I've only found it for the Fuji. It's it's a, a Fuji to M42 uh, adapter, but it's got this little tilt facility on it. I, I don't know if you can see it. You see there's some numbers on it. Yeah. Well, see if I can show you when it's opened up. There you go. You see, oh, see right, it's, yeah. up there. it's like a little yeah. gap. It yeah. tilts the lens backwards and forwards. So it, it's not a tilt shift. A tilt shift lens is quite expensive. It's about 300 pounds, mm. I think, for a tilt shift adapter. But that just tilts the lens. So if you've seen the sort of pictures like, you know, that look like a toy camera, you know, where you, it gives you a band of, of focus in the middle. And it, yeah. it, that's what that will do for you. So, so it's, not, it's, in, it's good to have that on your camera. And then when you just want to have a little bit of a tilt play, you can, you can do that. So that's what that is. So it's called a food. It's a Fuji to M42 tilt adapter. Okay. If you use Fuji, Sorry. I think. I think. Oh, was it Tracy? Uh, Tracy was one of the people. Helen Cherry was another. Uh, and was Sarah yeah. Williams has also asked about it. Yeah. Where, um, where did you buy it? Did you oh, I friend? got it off Amazon somewhere. I don't know. Okay. I, I, so yeah. Yeah. Type into Amazon. Dive into yeah. Amazon Fuji M42 tilt adapter. And I think, I can't remember who makes this one. Um, what I would say about the general adapters for the cameras, uh, K and F Connect are the ones that do a lot for the different cameras. So you can get one for Canon, Nikon, Sony, all sorts of different things. I would say with, with the vintage lenses that uh, probably the mirrorless are the best probably to go when you've got a mirrorless camera. Easier. Okay. Now, Kathy has asked, uh, what was the name of the author slash book that you mentioned in the first few minutes? You did say, I think it was a funny name. That's Twyla Tharp. <laughs> Twyla Tharp. T okay. T-W-Y-L-A Tharp. T-H-A-R-P. Okay. And the book's called The Creative Habit. And, um, and she's an American choreographer, but... The book isn't about choreography. Obviously, she uses choreography as her, um, it's her discipline, so she talks about it. But she does mention photographers and different things, and it's all about developing uh, a creative habit. Is it actually building creativity into your everyday yeah. uh, photography? Or okay, whatever. a creative name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kathy has asked another question relating to prints and exposure. She's heard that a print can be compromised if the highlights are blown out and therefore no ink is laid down. Have you had issues with that? No. I, I think sometimes, um, like you say, you know, it would be there's no ink on a white bit. No. Um, but Perhaps if you, it depends on the type of printer and the type of paper that you're using, it may affect the glossiness. Yes. I think so. so if you're kind of looking across, you might see something like that. So, I have, yeah, I haven't, seen, of, too, I haven't seen too much of yeah. a problem. But what I do sometimes do is I, I'll, I'll often, I, I don't do a lot of printing on glossy paper for these sort of prints. Mm -hmm. Often they'll, you've got to really pick the right paper for the print. So it might be something like a, a, a matte paper, you know. And some of the textured papers, because often they they can they can look a lot better with white highlights than gloss does. Because gloss, you can you know I, I, you've, you've really just got to get the right paper with it. But I, I, I print to acrylic as well, and that, there's not a problem with that. Not I don't print acrylic; I send them off to print. Yeah, yeah. I think, and then then the acrylic the, is over the print, so that probably would yeah you'd probably be okay because they put a white thing underneath anyway don't they? Yeah, they do. but you won't get anything beyond white it's just it's either no, white it's just or white. It's, it's either white or it's gray or it's, so, cream or yeah. it's a shade of white yeah. you, if you if you've got your white balance sorted and you, you get your white spot and it's white it's white so i think the paper's gonna okay. you, i think you'd have to play about with papers to see what's gonna work the best if you're using white okay yeah. Thank you. Uh, Christine has asked, how do you move forward with your own creative style after trying something you may have seen other photographers using successfully on social media? Um, you mean, is that a, how do you not copy what other people do? Is it, do, do, do you mean that? I, I guess so. Um, maybe, Christine, if, if you want to sort of expand on that, maybe um, we'll come back to that question. Maybe that would be easier. I mean, but, I'll, I'll be yes. honest, I, prefer, I don't try to look too much at what other photog contemporary photographers are doing, mainly because I don't want to be overly influenced by what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So although I look at, at some of the work, I find most of the stuff I see on social media 
Um, I don't know, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will get influenced. I get influenced by artists, but I tend to be influenced more by artists rather than photographers, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that does make sense. Uh, Julia has asked, have you ever successfully used the soft focus technique on wildlife? Um, no, not really. I don't do a lot of wildlife now, really. Um, I can see how you might be able to use it. I, I can see how you use it, but I think you'd have to be careful on the subject matter. I think it'd, it'd have to be something that, that, that really should. I mean, certainly you can use ICM and things like that and slow-mo and, and, you know, and, and, and get motion into images by uh, uh, using yeah. techniques. But, you know, I, I think you'd have to be careful how you were using it. It's a bit like with the... Um, uh, portrait photography isn't it you'd have to get the right subject and the right feel yeah. and the feel and i think often a lot of time people look at um i think there's an expectation from people when you're doing things like wildlife photography is that things are in a way going to be in focus and you're focusing on the, the animal or the subject aren't you so but no i haven't i haven't done it because i've never really tried never thought about trying that i have seen very you know images where like you say um, it might be wildebeest or something, and they're all moving, and the camera's moving with them, and yeah. you get the sense of movement, and they're all nothing sharp, yeah. but you can tell what yeah. they are. Yeah. And also images like uh, on misty days, you know, when it's the rutting season, perhaps the photographer has focused on the grass nearby or something, so and you yeah. just see the outline of the yeah, the that, that, and things that's like a that. good that's a good way of, of using it. Yes, yeah. Mm. You just again, but that's again having a creative approach to it and and, and finding. Yeah those sort of ways of, of doing it and sometimes what I, I've said earlier is that you fail a lot you do you can try things and sometimes it doesn't work it's just another, yeah, another, it's kind of building up your portfolio or your toolbox isn't it you try things and yeah. think oh that will, will work with this or yeah. you get good at a technique but it doesn't you don't have the opportunity to apply it to the you know it doesn't work with whatever subject you've got and then suddenly you see something and you think, That's right. uh, now yeah. I can use that technique yeah uh, Fabiana has said she shoots portraits and finds it very challenging to be both creative that requires her to get in touch with how I feel and nurturing the relationship with the subject do you have any advice on that um, I don't really because I don't do portrait photography it's not mm. really my area and I wish I could give you some advice because um, I think um, I, I struggle with, I'm, no, I'm not saying I struggle with portrait photography, but because I've not really got the experience of building that sort of yeah. relationship with a, with a client or, a, or a, an individual, I, I really, I'm not sure I could offer advice. I don't know if anybody else could on that, but, um, you know, it, it's, yeah. I mean, I always think things, it's worth just trying different things. I mean, if, you, if you're with a client or we're with somebody and you want to do some portraiture, I think it's worth trying some of the things I've mentioned is like trying a little bit of ICM, try and shoot through and things like that. Because mm. they can be just slightly different methods of uh, of shooting a coming away from that standard, you know, just get someone in front of your portrait. So yeah, and, and certainly soft focus is great. I mean, out of focus using out of focus for portraits is great. Yeah, it almost gives it that that you know remote and distant feel. That that's all I could say really. But I think there's probably people on here that might be more experienced with portrait photography than I am. <laughs> I'm being honest really yeah, no that's that's fine that's that's great that's what we want um and uh, I was going to suggest that maybe that's a good reason for uh using a model you know hiring a model obviously at the moment with the kind of lockdown it's not an ideal time for it but if you have a model you can practice all those things you don't need to worry about building the relationship you can just try all those different things that's um, true. And if you can't well, actually use a real, I mean, you might be able to bribe someone in your house to, yeah. in your household yeah. to be a model. Yeah. Or, or, you know, I don't know, try it with a football. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, pretend yeah. that's the head. You know, it depends what you're trying to achieve, if you're yeah. doing something creative with light, whatever. Um, yeah, that would be my suggestion. Uh, Jane Peters has asked, uh, what exposures are used for multiple exposures? Uh, so the pics of the trees after the shoot through explanation do you do it in camera or photoshop in camera right i aim to do as much as i possibly can in camera um you can do it in photoshop and what i explain the thing is with with multiple exposures it depends on your camera for a start because 
like with the Fuji, the earlier Fuji X's, uh, you'd only got double exposure. So they were limited to almost like a, what's called like an average mode. It basically, uh, you take the first exposure and the second exposure is average based on an over the top of the second exposure. And so it's almost like layer, like a layer in, in Photoshop, say a lighting layer or something like that. Uh, but with more sophisticated cameras, um, like the Fuji X-T4 and some of the Canons and the uh, Nikons, you can do up to some nine, nine or 10 exposures, but then you also get a variety of different blend modes. So you get, you get you usually get four blend modes, uh, additive, average, bright and dark. And that makes the flexibility then of, of doing uh, multiple exposures um, quite uh, extensive. But I try to do, well, I do all of my, uh, multiple exposures in camera because I only go into Photoshop if I'm doing composite work. Uh, I very rarely go into, I don't want to go into Photoshop unless I really have to. Yeah. Um, so most of my work that's done that I've shown you tonight, all of it is in camera, multiple exposures. That's what I aim for. Right. Okay. Uh, but, but Jenny has said uh, she is about to get an XT4. And oh. she, she's saying, will she find it very different from her X-T2? No, you'll see a difference in the, um, uh, it's slightly bigger. And the, the X-T4 has got in body stabilization as well. So you might find you can shoot handheld with a little bit of a lower shutter speed. Uh, you'll certainly see a difference in terms of the way it uh, captures, uh, you know, the, I think the autofocus is fa faster yeah. and things like that. There's a few technical things that you will notice. Yes. Um, but the biggest thing you'll notice if you like multiple exposures, you've going from double exposures up to nine and four blend modes. And so, but overall, I, I would still, I would still make the jump. Uh, if if yeah. I was on, you, you notice a bigger jump from X-T2 than you would from X-T3. Because the X-T3 has Definitely. got the same processor as the yeah. X-T4. So, yeah. But I think crucially, you're not going to find yourself hunting around trying to find the settings, you know, the, no. the control and the video layouts, features, very similar. The video features on the X-T4 are, are better as well, but you might not use video. And you've got a really nice very angle screen. Yeah, oh yeah, you've got really screen, which is very screen. useful when you lay down in the grass and you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you don't need to lay down. No. <laughs> That's great. Um, oh, Kathy's just confirming uh, that it, she was talking about glossy um, prints, so that's that answered? Yeah, I mean, I tend to use uh, Platinum Brighter for my uh, prints, so the thought to speed Platinum Brighter, so the glossy, it's sort of semi-gloss is that, and I tend to use it for certain images, whereas I think a lot of the stuff I'll, I'll use a matte paper, because they, they suit the sort of style I, I, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Tracy has pointed out a very good point, that you can, of course, photograph people as long as you remain socially distant. So, you know, don't use your 50 mil, swap to your 7200 and good to go. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's 85 millimeter, 100 millimeter lens for, that. Yeah. that's definitely two meters away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Anetta said, would vintage lenses have a place for portrait work? Now you say you don't oh, shoot yeah. a great deal of portrait, but I, yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. A lot of people buy them for portrait. portrait. But a lot of people buy them for film work as well because they're really good. Because often they have, uh, uh, they they don't have a, they don't have a clicky aperture. You, do you know what I mean? You know when you click the aperture, yeah. and when you're yeah. doing film work, you don't want a clicky aperture. You just want an aperture that moves round. And uh, yeah. so, uh, but yeah, they you can get some fantastic uh, portrait lenses. Uh, but you know that they're, they're, they're as good a lens as, as the, you know the glass is different, but some of the quality of the glass is fantastic just do a little bit of research on them get on youtube yeah. and start watching videos yeah great um helen is asking you whether you do this talk for camera clubs in person or via zoom i do it via zoom i haven't done this particular talk for camera club but i've done an extended version of this for the rps so i do a, like a, i've done it like i'm doing like a, a three workshops for the rps so uh, but yes i can do this talk for the for a camera club but i do three talks i do i do this one, I do creative techniques. I do creative composites. Mm -hmm. So I go from this point right the way through to, so the next, the next um, one in this series, if you like, is um, creative techniques, actually using these and how you use them and, you know, all right. the techniques with ICM and things like that. 
but yes, just get, just drop me an email or, or get contact me on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, Jenny's saying she's very much looking forward to six multiple exposures, but I think it's nine, isn't it? With the XT4? XT4 is nine, yeah. So you've got three more than you thought. And you've got four blend modes. There you go. That's pretty good. Um, Anne Owen says, it sounds rather daunting reversing the front element on the Helios. Is there much of a risk of messing the lens up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> basically, it's an ratchet, yeah you know yeah. You, you, you basically you've just got a little ret on the this isn't the helios but on the helios you've got a little retaining ring that holds the the front element in and you've got to get you've got to get a tiny little screwdriver and you've got to push against the little thing that takes it off and pushes it around it's screwed in so you've got to strap something in there to stop you scratching the lens so but you, you can pick those up for about 10 or 15 quid so if you scratch it you can you can go and find another one but yes it sounds daunting but it's not actually as difficult as you as it, you think the problem you've got with them being old lenses is that that little retaining ring may be stuck hard yeah and so you know you may have to sort of spend some time you might not be i've got one i can't get it off and i could probably take it into a camera shop and they probably do it for me but you know they'll have a little thing that you can fit in and it off circlip clip thing or something yeah, yeah. okay yeah. right so yeah it sounds a bit scary but maybe have a strong cup of tea yeah, yeah. yeah. give it a go yes uh, yeah. carol said that the rps is all sold out of your workshop so are you planning any other date i am i've got another uh, i've said to mark that I'll, he keeps asking me do you want to do another one so i said well, i'll do one till everybody gets fed up on me but i haven't got a date for it yet but it is um uh, there's only five on each session you see so it, it it fills up but i think there's another one probably due for around about august and he'll keep asking me to do them until until we don't get anybody so, <laughs> so there'll be a point when people say enough yeah well people here are asking for a t uh, another webinar about the composite uh, composites Oh, but composites and uh yeah okay at some point yeah we can do that <laughs> yeah. okay um uh, just a couple more questions and then you want to carry on a little bit more don't you yeah if, if it's all right we could do it probably be about another 10 15 minutes if that's all okay. right yeah um, so yeah. amanda has asked um you have to think back now what lens did you use for the blurred background ground series uh, oh the the autumn woodland one i'm not 100 sure to be very honest that one, yeah this one Oh, is that your Helios? Auto reflector. Oh, you okay? Auto reflector. It's called an there auto reflector, and it's an f one point seven Japanese lens, and it, it might you might see it as an auto shinon. Uh, it's an old lens, but that was twenty eight quid, I think, something like that. About twenty eight pound for that. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, Melanie, uh, this is the last question for now. Melanie has heard about lens baby lenses. Um, I think somebody she knows has got the lens baby velvet. And she says it makes the images look out of focus so she doesn't really get the point is that the point yeah it's um, a soft it's soft it, the whole yeah. point of it no, is i've actually got happen to have the yeah. one of the velvets here yeah it's soft yeah. It, it's soft you go you won't get in focus that people can't yeah. always handle it and uh the, the, i like the lens baby um uh sweet spot because you do get a little sweet spot even that yeah. but even that at 2.5 is is very is still soft and, and yeah. if you use an helios with a reverse element you won't get any focus at all but <laughs> i always say if to let go you've just got to let go just yeah. just don't worry about it and she's saying basically are they suitable for any specific genre and i think actually lens baby when they bring out their lenses they always say uh, that oh this is suitable or appropriate for portraits and then they said the first thing that happens is they just see pictures of landscapes or yeah. macro and you know yeah. you can yeah. do anything with them it's just about you can. your imagination you can. And, really and this these the ones that I like, why i like the, the composer one you've got you've got f2.5 to f22 so you can do landscape i'm, I'm doing a pro you'll see actually i'm doing a, a project uh and using them as more of a landscape lens but i use them for flower photography and any other photo but i, I just think i'll go out and shoot with a lens baby and see what what happens yeah. I, I really I, like them. I'm, I'm a I do. Fan, I, think they're great. I think they're great fun. Yeah. If you are having or had a really stressful day and you want to go out and take some photographs with your camera and just kind of get, you know, you're talking about getting in the zone, finding lens babies are a really good way of doing it because, yeah. like, 
it's manual focus you just forget yeah. everything and just concentrate on the image and yeah. you know trying to get it sharp yeah. in the right places go line a field somewhere and, and yeah. yeah yeah okay so that's the end of the questions uh at this section do you want to yeah. just finish so, your presentation on the screen again uh, i'm going to talk to you in this session now a little bit more about how you can just talk you through some projects that you can use why I like projects is because they can help you develop your skills. So if you if you if you if you're stuck with something, doing a little project can really help you through it, and uh, it can help you address your weaknesses. And what I say, I always say to people, be honest about what what your weaknesses are. You know, it's like any any sort of craft. You know, don't practice the things you're good at. Practice the things that you're not so good at, and uh, and, and 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 sort of uh, do it that way. And and projects can help you with that it will it can help you learn new techniques so you can do a project just based around one new technique that you want to use they help you keep focused and they you can give yourself a time scale so if you do if you are working and things like that and you've got to fit it around something you can give yourself a time scale to to do it and and and, um, and, and work it around that way but it can help you keep keep a, a, a good focus and i'm just giving you some here that are suggestions. I'm not saying you can go out and do all of these, but um, people talk about a 365 project. I know I couldn't do one. I couldn't do a three. I, I admire anybody that can do a 365 project, basically take an image every day. I think the only problem with that is that you could probably get a little bit complacent and start taking images just for the sake of taking images. And for me, that that's really against why I, I take the images. So I think you could fall into a, 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 a trap with a 365 project. So that's just a, a suggestion. What I would say is try something like a 30 day project. So you're photographing something every day and find something that's really that's going to you know, really sort of focus your mind on on uh, uh, on something or even try a same place project, you know, try going to the same place or standing in the same same spot for 52 weeks for a, a week every week. Go to the same spot and take I know a lady that did a project over lockdown and she stood on her back door back patio and took a picture of the same spot of the sky every day for three months. And uh, I imagine, I know, I know she's not editing them all yet, but I imagine she's got this great montage of images of, of the sky at different times. You know, I think she went out at the same time every day. So think about, and, and having a consistent theme is a good, uh, a, a, a good, a good thing. So, so, you know, you might think, well, I'm going to go out and shoot. I'm going to do a 30 day project. I'm going to do a just in black and white or something like that. So keep the theme consistent if you're going to do a project. So don't try and move around too much with it and and find tell a story you know develop a narrative try and tell a story with your your photographs i think telling a story with one photograph is one of the hardest things you can do some people do it really well um others find it quite difficult i find it difficult to tell a story with one photograph but find a narrative and build a series of images around a narrative and that narrative could be a poem, it could be poetry, it could be music, take some lyrics for some music. I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, a project I've got around uh, a poem. Or go out and shoot in the style of somebody, and I don't mean necessarily photographer. You know, if you want to have a go at some of these creative techniques, go out and shoot and think about um, Turner, the painter, who was an impressionist painter. Go out and shoot in the style of Turner. And, um, and, and there's a guy called Andy Gray who does a lot of uh, ICM work. He's a Northumberland photographer, is Andy. And he's, he's, he's a fan of Turner and a lot of his work is based around Turner. Albeit he does a lot in, in Photoshop, but he goes out and he shoot, does ICMs, capturing images using quite flamboyant um, uh, ICM style. Shooting the style of Monet or shooting the style, if you like the uh, abstracts and abstract impressionism and things like that go out and find a painter that you really like and try and go and shoot something in the style of that painter and it can be quite an interesting project you know go and try and shoot in the style of Jackson Pollock or something like that you know it can be a really interesting technique to use just to get something different in your mind try a self-portrait series and I don't mean necessarily just sit in front of the camera I mean try doing a double exposure or a multiple exposure series uh, of, of yourself and I know it's the hardest thing for photographers do is sit in front of the screen but um it can actually be quite cathartic and i think you can it might tell you something about yourself by doing a, a self-portrait you know you, and 
do, we do selfies all the time, so why not sit in front of a nice camera instead of a, a little phone camera? Um, make a montage, you know, you've seen some of my sort of layouts, but make yourself a, a montage of images, like I did with that woodland image, in that the final image was the montage, was that sort of group of images. Have a go at doing a composite, you know, get into Photoshop and bring a few images in and try building a little composite up and things like that. Go out and shoot ICN for a week or, or just shoot one, one style of photography for a week. And, and a, another interesting thing you can do is limit yourself. So go out and if, you, if you're short a time or you, or you just want to go out and just do some, some, a little bit of photography, go out and just give yourself, say, 12 shots. Just go out and shoot 12 images and then stop shooting and come back and see what you get because that will that will make you limit yourself like that that will really make you work on the images that you are doing and it might make you it might help you seeing a little bit better that and um look at alternative capture you know photography for me is in a broad sense is anything that captures light it uses a light in, a, in any sort of medium so that includes using things like wet media cyanotypes film go shoot film uh, lumen printing, solar graphs, scanning, get your scanner out and do some scanning. Uh, do a print scan montage, do a print of something, cut it up, do it on some cheap paper, cut it up and lay it out on a scanner and reprint it or re-photograph it, re it or, or, or re-scan it and things like that. There's all sorts of different uh, little, uh, sorry, I've got the dog uh, nattering me here. <laughs> Go away. And uh, so there's all sorts of things you can do uh, with these projects, you know, you don't have to limit yourself. Um, and what I would say is find something that you really love and that you connect with and don't try too hard to be original because there's a lot of things in photography that's been done before, an awful lot, and we'll, we'll, I'll prove that to you uh, later. And if you can, stay local because if you're doing something and you're putting barriers up by making it too far away. So I live in Wakefield. So if, if I'm, I'm not going to do a, a project in the Lake District, as much as I'd love to go up there every, every other day, but I'm, it's just not going to happen. And don't put little obstacles in your way that are going to stop you from, from doing it. So make it easier to make repeat visits, whether that's with, with whatever subject it is that you use. And think about the tools and techniques that you're going to use on the project. So don't just pile into it, you know, think about, plan it out and think about how you might decide you're going to process all the images in a particular way. So for instance, you may, be, you may be decide you're going to do them in a very, like we said earlier, a muted tone. So you want muted colours for, the, for these images. And so um, if you're editing them in Lightroom or Photoshop, create some presets for that so that you're not having to do them all, all the time. And what I would say to you is don't buy presets, make your own, because presets are, are geared up towards your photography really. So create a style within your uh, post-processing uh, uh, program, with, if that's Lightroom or Photoshop, and then just create a preset that you can apply. And then you'll have to do minor adjustments based on the, the, the images that you've got. Because you want to really develop some consistency if you're gonna do a project. So the images in a project really need to come together. You don't want them looking all, going all over the place. And think hard about what the end result would be. Would it be a, a set of prints? Would it be part of a portfolio? Is it gonna be a, a, a panel? Probably even for a, an RPS panel and things like that. And also think, you know, there are other things you can do. You might decide you're going to do an ebook. It's easy to make an ebook in in Lightroom uh, and um, uh, uh, print it as a PDF and give that out to people and things like that. But um, or send it off and have a blurb book done and, and things. You might even do what I'm doing. I'm going to create a video. So um, it's important to think what the end result is before you you uh, you sort of start. You might make those choices as you make as you're doing the uh, the project. But I'm going to tell you about two two projects I'm working on at the moment, just to give you some idea of a uh, an Im of, of a project that's built around a narrative and a project that's built just on, uh, if you like, a a way of doing the photography, a, a merging of, of different uh, mediums, as it were. And the first one's called Dry Stone Wall. And it's uh, after a poem by Robert Frost called Mending Wall. And um, I'm actually going to produce a video from this because I want to develop my video skills. So it's going to be multimedia and it'll have stills, photography and video. So that, that's what that's about. I'm going to show you that. And then the fusion project is about fusing. And this, I suppose, was my lockdown project, really. I did a lot of cyanotyping when, it was, uh, when we were in lockdown. We had some nice weather. 
And um, so this is about a fusion between two types of photographic media, the cyanotype and bringing the digital together and the way that they merge, to, I can merge them together as a digital project. And I'm looking at mostly ab macro abstract and, and scanning for that. And obviously the cyanotypes themselves what I end up with. And, and I haven't decided what that's going to be. So I'm going to talk to you first about the dry stone wall project. And that's the first line of the poem is something there is that doesn't love a wall. And the idea behind this project is me going, I discovered last year that the Yorkshire Dales has over 5,000 miles worth of uh, dry stone wall. And that's like stretching from London to Pakistan. So it's a lot of wall. And... Um, I'm also, but I'm, I'm not going to be going up to the Yorkshire Dales to do it. I'm doing it in my own environment because we've got lots of walls in this country. We've got lots of walls in the north. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's no shortage of subject matter. So you can see from these here, I started this before the lockdown. So I've, I've only just started to pick it back up again. And uh, I'm doing the wall details using ICM and multiple exposure and things like that. I'm looking at using the lens baby uh, for the mainly for the wider landscape, if I can, and uh, probably the regular ones, and then using the micro, uh, the macro to do the micro environment of the things that are growing in the wall. And so I'm in terms of the narrative, you know, this is part of the narrative, the gaps I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made, but spring mending time we find them there. So I was out the other day just photographing gaps in walls, um, people looking at me a bit strangely, but I'm used to that as a photographer. Um, and um, this is the, the wider, starting to build up the wider environment. Some of these are just sketch photographs, just to sort of get, get some idea of how I, um, uh, I might want to... Uh, uh, go back and possibly photograph these again. Um, and I'm building up images of the micro environment in, in the wall. So you get the idea of the sort of work I'm doing in that, that with this. But what I'm ultimately aiming to do is build a video out of this. And, and it's about me developing my video skills as, a, as not so much my photography skills, but building a video, but also building the stills into the video. So that, that's how that's going to pan out as, a, as a, a project. And then the Fusion project, which is based around um, using, and, and for anybody that doesn't know what a cyanotype is, it was invented by Sir John Herschel in 1842. And it's basically a wet media. It's, uh, you, you, you basically discovered that if you create a, a, these photosensitive chemicals and you put them on an absorbent at surface like paper or wood or cloth and then lay something on them and expose them to UV light you'll get a, an imprint and so um, and I use a method called wet cyanotype where you put the chemical on the page on the paper and then while it's wet you put other products like salt vinegar uh, turmeric uh, soap bubbles and things like that on the, on the surface and you leave them out and you let them exposed in the sun and I came up with this idea because I was seeing all these things happening in the in the chemical process while it was happening so I started taking uh, micro, uh, macro images of the um, of the of the um, the surfaces of the cyanotypes while they were exposing and I started to see all these wonderful abstract patterns and so as I started letting them and, and, and you lose all this when you actually then wash the image off when you wash the products off and the chemical off, you don't get this, you've lost this. So these are all sort of images taken while in the process of the, um, uh, the chemical reaction. And uh, they are, they're just taken with, with the macro waves. And I do some double exposures as well, do some multiple exposures with them to see whether I can get something from the multiple exposures. So you can see the sort of images, and this is an example of an image Prior to me washing it, that's with the cling film on and it's, it's done its exposure and it's ready for a wash. But this is double exposure images of the, um, uh, of the cyanotypes before they've gone into the, uh, you know, before I've got to this stage, if you like. This is when they've sort of first gone out and they've got lots of vibrant colour and things like that. And uh, these are the images, the same image. This is the washed image. And then this is an image that I brought into Lightroom and I've made some changes in Lightroom. So I'll, it'll go through a series of different processes, but I'm interested in the actual process of the chemical wet from to the digital. So that, that's the whole purpose of this project is, is finding these interesting abstracts on the, the, uh, on the sheets while they're, they're uh, being exposed and this is a final this is another final image uh, that's that's actually been washed and, and that is the final image that's scanned I'll scan them uh, in part of the way through the process and that's what that project is about 
and um, so it, it, that's just giving you a couple of, of projects that I'm doing. So, you know, it's worth you sort of having to think about what it is you want to do and, and, and what you can do that, that might be a little bit more creative to, to what you, you normally do. But what I want to say really is try to be genuine. Try and be as genuine as you can in your photography and try and avoid cliches. Photograph what you care about and look at everything with a critical eye, everything, because the subject matter that you've got out there is, is, is limitless, really. And I'll give you this list of photographers. I'm not going to go through them all, but, and you can see it if you watch, if you want to watch the video back, and you can do it on there, uh, but, uh, or take a screenshot at some point. But these are photographers, they're mostly landscape photographers. But what I would say is, have a look at some of these. These are really, really inspirational photographers. And there's a lot of contemporary photographers here um there's photographers that are older photographers and that i really admire and, and the work love the work and if you want to have a look at the pictorialist go and have a look at the pictorialist these are my favorite photographers these are people that thought that photography was an art and they wanted to bridge that gap between the technical side of photography and producing a piece of art and they bridged that gap until ansel adams came along and they had an argument of falling out and then they they went the completely different ways and, 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 and the F64 group was set up. But anyway, we won't go there. There was a, <laughs> a big argument, a big argument. Some nasty stuff said about each other, to be honest. It was uh, very interesting. But what I want to uh, leave you with is, is these images. Now, these are very, very contemporary images. And um, you may or may, have, may not have seen these before, but these are actually images that are 70 years old. These are by a photographer called Ernst Haas. And these images were made in the 1950s. And Ernst Haas, when he started, he, he was one of the early exponents of using colour film. And when he started using colour film, at the time it was very unpopular because people thought serious photographers just used black and white film and that was it. And so he was looked frowned upon a little bit, was Ernst Haas. But not only did he use colour film, he used ICM. And it was like, well, what are you doing? What are you doing, man? You know, this isn't the thing to do. So what um what i want to stress with this is that there's nothing new you know all a lot of this has been done before you know you, you're often you know following in the, in the footsteps of the greats and i think ernest Ars, as a photographer is ahead of his time i think his work is so contemporary you look at his abstract work he did in new york and venice and places like that and if you like portrait photography he also did some fantastic hollywood hollywood movie stars so go and have a look at some of the old hollywood movie images he made because they, they're fantastic too um but creativity is hard it's not easy you've got to work at it there are no shortcuts, but if you work at it and you get out there, you learn the craft, learn the craft of photography, and you will, you will, you will find your vision. You will find something that works for you. Um, Buddy's been really good tonight for me. Uh, he sends a high five to everybody. Anybody that does a she-click coffee morning will know we bring often bring our dogs along. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, Buddy, Buddy's now crying to go out. He's, he's, he's been held in long enough, so he wants to go out now. So, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you for Angela for organising this. Thank you to Fujifilm for um, sponsoring it. Well, thank you very much. Everyone's found that really inspiring, very enjoyable. Uh, it's, it was fully subscribed and everybody's stayed on to the end. So thank, thank you very much. much for keeping everybody entertained tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I hope everybody's enjoyed it. I, I enjoy these. I, I quite enjoy it. I quite sh enjoy sharing. I, I don't mind um, rambling on. <laughs> well, it's been great. Thank you very much. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Everybody.